Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, lawmakers have been busy working on bills like expanding energy conservation, adding a climate justice curriculum, establishing a student borrower's bill of rights, and reducing the cost of prescription drugs. Plus, the governor releases a bonding plan. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Senator Jason Rarick is sponsoring legislation that would update and expand Minnesota's energy conservation efforts. I spoke with him this week. The Energy Conservation and Optimization Act was a bill that you carried last year. The House passed it. Uh, there's movement again this year. The Energy News Network last month, Frank Jossi, wrote that there's some optimism about this bill this year. So before we get into what this act is, are you optimistic? Yeah, and first, uh, thank you very much for having me on. And, you know, I am optimistic this year that uh, we're going to have some movement. I've been uh, working with a lot of the folks involved with this over the last year and, and working with a number of legislators. And um, I... I firmly believe we're uh, getting close to being able to bring it to the Senate floor and, and the House floor. And uh, our bills are a little bit different, but I think we can work on those. And I, I think we can get something done this year. So I think uh, it's been like shortened to be called the ECO Act, which is a lot easier to say than the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act. But what is it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Ultimately, the, our electric utilities in Minnesota have a mandate to uh, find one and a half percent efficiencies on their system every year. And then they're also required to spend one and a half percent of their revenues uh, to promote energy savings every year. And for the big three, uh, the investor owned utilities, like Excel and Otter Tail Power and Minnesota Power, you know, they've been having a relatively easy time. Their systems are large enough, they can find those efficiencies. But our smaller electric co-ops and uh, small city municipals, they've really started to struggle. And so this is doing some reform to that conservation improvement program. It brings some new things in that they can count towards their energy savings. And then if they meet those savings, they do not have to spend that one and a half percent of their revenues anymore. So part of this bill is just to help out those smaller providers to be able to uh, keep up with the kinds of efficiency changes that the state is looking for. Yeah, exactly. You know, there, you know, there's only so many uh, light uh, lights that can be changed to LEDs, and you know, factories that can be upgraded with their motors and such. So we've done a lot of that already. Now we need to start looking at new ways to to bring those efficiencies to a higher level. One testifier when this bill was before committee a couple weeks ago um, from Owatonna Public Utilities said that fuel switching is one of the most controversial aspects of the bill. What is fuel switching and why is it controversial? So fuel switching is related to when you're switching from one source of energy over to another. And, and this one would be looking at if um, probably the number one source that might be used in this would be when somebody is switching from their gasoline automobile over to an electric automobile. And what the utilities are looking for is because that societal shift is happening and it lowers emissions, that they would like to be able to count that in their energy savings goal. And, and I think a lot of people agree with that. And, and one of the reasons this has become so controversial is the propane industry and some of the other delivered fuels see this as a, a real threat um, to their industry, but I, I don't see that this bill is really that threat. It's not going to do away with those industries. It's just trying to recognize that there are societal changes that are happening and to be able to count those, those societal changes towards these energy savings goals. Is there anything in the bill that prefers one type of energy over another? Uh, no, and actually this bill is working to be more far more neutral as far as energy sources uh, the electrical industry is the only industry that has this mandate to find one and a half percent efficiency on their system. And, and so when they've heard the argument from the fuel uh, industry that this is a, uh, you know, picking winners and losers, they try to point out quite quickly that, uh, 
they were the ones who were basically picked as the losers years ago when this mandate was put on them and no other energy sector. So this is trying to help them become on a level playing field once again. So actually far more uh, neutral to which source of energy you're using. So somebody like me who has a gas boiler isn't going to, there isn't going to be incentives for me to change to some sort of, you know, electrical system. Right. And actually the way the bill is drafted right now, um, if you're using natural gas or propane, um, they are cleaner sources of energy than electricity. And it would not count towards um, this conservation improvement program and the energy goals for the electric utilities if you chose to switch from gas to electricity. And, and it wouldn't be cost effective for you to do that right now either, which is why I don't believe this is going to drive any of these, the propane or the delivered fuels um, out of the market. So in essence, what kind of impact is this bill gonna have on the average Minnesotan? Um, I believe the long-term impact is uh, will help keep your electric utility rates uh, the same or potentially even lower uh, by you know, getting rid of that uh, mandated spend, uh, that one and a half percent every year that the electric utilities have to spend to promote energy savings saying if you get there, you don't have to spend this money. Um, I believe that will help uh, bring the average ratepayers uh, bills down a little bit. And since we're talking about energy and what's happened in Texas with that huge winter storm and the power failures and the impacts on the water, you know, we're weatherized here. We're, we're used to this. But is there any kind of lesson in terms of energy that we as Minnesotans should take from that? Yeah, I, I believe so. Um, you know, I think we have a, a very good group that monitors our grid here called MISO. Um, they have energy sources uh, from around the area that they can pick from. But I think the one thing it really points out is until storage becomes a, a bigger piece of the puzzle here and we develop new storage techniques, uh, we have to be careful how many sources of renewable energy we put on such as wind and solar um, when we have too many of those sources go down, we still require electricity. So we, we need what we call that base load available at all times. And, you know, right now, natural gas and um, nuclear provide most of that for Minnesota. So we cannot just get rid of that knowing what our climate is until we really figure out that new way of storing electricity for long periods of time. So does that have anything to do with load optimization? Because that was another term that I saw in the bill. Yeah, um, similar, uh, not quite the same, but that would be like, you know, for, and, and that's another thing this bill is trying to incorporate is, you know, it would be the same. So many people today have their water heaters on an off peak system. And so what, that's allowing the electric utility to manage the load that's out there. So whether it would be your water heater or a air conditioner or air source heat pump, and in the future our electric cars that are charging, the utilities would be able to determine when they're allowed to run and when they're not so that they can manage their system and not have everything on at one time so they can stagger it and keep the demand at its lowest point uh, possible at all times during the day. Uh, one last question. Do, do we in Minnesota have the workforce necessary to move forward with clean energy, with acts like this, with any potential new technologies that come online? You know, I, I believe we do. And we're seeing a new uh, resurgence in uh, kind of promoting that to our, uh, the high school kids. Um, and that's something I greatly appreciate as an electrician outside of uh, the legislature. Um, you know, these jobs are very good jobs. I do believe right now the workforce is there, but we also see that there are a great number who are retiring and we need to replace them in the near future. But I think the more we talk about it and promote it, the more younger people will consider it as a career option. Senator Jason Rarick, I wanna thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This week at the Capitol on Monday, lawmakers introduced bipartisan legislation to establish a student borrower's bill of rights. I don't think it'll be a surprise to anyone that the student loan crisis in the United States is mammoth. Total student loan debt has surpassed
credit card debt to become the second largest class of debt in the United States, with students owing a stunning $1.7 trillion. I graduated in the spring of 2008 with $50,721.95 in student loans. I started making payments six months later. I vividly remember seeing only $1.83 of my first payment go towards my principal. For more than 10 years, my loan servicer put me on different payment plans, even though most of the time I never requested the changes. And for many of those payments, $0 went towards my principal. On April 5th, 2019, I applied for public service loan forgiveness for the first time. According to my records, I had made 120 payments and was finally eligible. Two months later, I was denied. They told me I wasn't on the correct payment plan and I had only made 21 qualifying payments. I would not be eligible for another eight years. I felt defeated. That same month, my loan was transferred and split between two different loans. The total, $51,056.72. This was more than $300 above what I had originally borrowed and had been paying on for over the past decade. The first estimate that my loan servicer gave me showed an initial payment of $2,875. I was shocked, but I thought, well, you know, I can make that one payment work. Then I looked at the fine print. Initial payment did not mean a one-time only first-time payment. It was what they expected me to pay every month. On the same page, they also showed a maximum payment of $500 a month. I felt like I was being misled. Bill of Rights would enshrine several protections into law to make sure that student servicer, student loan servicers act the way that we expect them to, that they not misapply payment, payments or mislead borrowers. There's a term out there, predatory lending, not saying that all service providers are like this, but obviously I think it's, it's well known that they do exist and they're out there. And we've got to find a way to make sure that our borrowers, especially young people in the very beginning stages of their lives, first learning about loans, how they work and setting expectations for the rest of their life on what they can expect in terms of the loan process. They need some protections. And on Tuesday, Governor Tim Walz unveiled a $518 million bonding proposal. Called the 2021 Local Jobs and Projects Plan, nearly half of the proposed spending would go to support the state's existing assets, with $52.5 million for improvements to trails, buildings, and facilities controlled by the DNR. $119 million for the state's institutions of higher learning, and $43 million for enhanced security at the state capitol. Governor Walls would also like to see $100 million devoted to preserving and expanding access to affordable housing, $150 million for the rebuilding of areas in Minneapolis and St. Paul that were damaged by civil unrest last summer, and $15 million to invest in projects led by community-based organizations that serve communities of color and American Indians. Finally, the governor proposes $14.5 million to match federal funds for the State Veterans Cemetery in Redwood Falls and to develop passenger rail. Following the governor's announcement, Senator Tom Bach, chair of the Senate Capital Investment Committee, issued a statement which said, This year, the top priorities at the legislature are putting together the state budget and appropriately responding to the coronavirus pandemic. At the appropriate time, I am hopeful the legislature and the governor will again come together to produce a bonding bill focused on the critical needs of Minnesotans. And on Wednesday, lawmakers released a bipartisan bill that may reduce the cost of prescription drugs. The goal of this bill is to make um, pharmaceutical prescription drugs called biosimilars competitive with biologics to reduce the cost to consumers and make it more competitive. Right now, biologics have a monopoly, essentially, and um, are making it very cost prohibitive for people to afford their drugs. So this bill hopefully will reduce the burden on taxpayers. Reducing the risk to patients through biosimilar insurance coverage parity is, is the goal. And as I said, it is the biologics are the significant driver of prescription drug spending in the United States, accounting for about 40% of total prescription drug spending uh, from biologics. And then biosimilars are those lower priced um, versions of these brand name biologics 
and they've got no clinical meaningful difference in safety, purity, or potency uh, when compared to the brand name project, product. And in most instances, there could be numerous biosimilars produced by different companies. And so we wanna make sure that the market competition allows Minnesota patients to get those particular uh, biosimilars uh, or be eligible to get those bios biosimilars, uh, providing that that is what their doctors prescribe. We love these new drugs because they enhance the quality of life. They extend life, but we can no longer be content to only have the most expensive version of these drugs available to our constituents and to patients. And it reminds me a little bit of um, the old saying, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, to put that in perspective, it would be like saying, well, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, uh, but only if it is a red delicious apple from this orchard. These, these drugs are biosimilars are coming to market, but because of something called the rebate trap, where the brand name manufacturers will threaten to remove all their rebates, not just from their biologic, but potentially from other drugs, if the payer or the provider um, offers these biosimilars. So we have to remove that threat and address these rebate traps so there's more competition between biosimilars and biologic. Student environmental activists recently spoke to the press about their efforts to incorporate climate justice into the state's educational curriculum. A lot of us have had experiences with teachers who deny climate change or have experiences with a lack of education. And we really wanted to see this in our schools. Um, so to start, uh, we researched a lot of bills and looked at and drew inspiration from similar ones and then began writing our bill with the help of a lot of other people. It concerned me that I really didn't know anything about this topic. Um, the only really resource that I had was Google and essentially everything that I know today was things that I self-studied from resources that I could only find on the internet. Um, essentially the purpose of this bill and this legislation is to provide easy and accessible information to students across Minnesota. One of the goals of this education plan is to ensure that academic standards address the needs of the modern of the workforce, are inclusive of ethnic studies, and are reflective of students of color and indigenous students. And our bill makes sure that students are equipped with a deep understanding of climate change. Climate justice is a framework that puts people first and views the effects of climate change as interconnected with systemic forms of oppression and connects the effects of climate change with social and economic justice issues. Um, so it centers people who have been systemically oppressed. Um, by teaching climate justice, students will learn about the systems of oppression like racism and how they interact with climate change. Senator Lindsey Port is the Senate sponsor of legislation to establish a model curriculum for teaching environmental justice, and I spoke with her this week. You were author of a bill that would require school districts and charter schools to provide climate justice instruction. What does that mean? Hi, Shannon. Thanks for having me. It's nice to see you again. Um, this bill means that it would be added to a core part of the curriculum, actually, through all sorts of different subjects, um, from elementary all the way through high school, to start discussing the impacts that climate, um, climate change, um, pollution, and the choices we've made as society, how those have disparate impacts um, across our communities. The bill says requiring that schools provide this instruction. So if passed, this is a practical question, would the curriculum be mandatory? And if so, what about teacher training? And would colleges need to incorporate these ideas into their teacher, tra teacher training programs? Yeah, so these are really important questions and they're conversations we're still having. Um, we're working with education um, associations, with teachers, with folks who write curriculum um, to really understand how this would be implemented. And, and we are, that's an ongoing process that we'll continue to do um, both us on the legislative side, also the students that we're working with um, and the experts in this field. 
um, it, you know, it does mean that we are multiple conversations away from the right answer or the perfect answer on this. But the idea is that, yes, it would be just melded into the current curriculum because we already teach on sort of all of these things and just adding an additional way that we talk about it. This, the idea for this bill was brought to you by a group of youth environmental activists. Obviously, it's good for young people to get civically involved and to learn about the process in a, in a real world kind of way. But historically, young people's voices rarely gain any traction. Why should lawmakers listen? Yeah, that's a, it's an important question. And I think like this bill is really a great um, representation of that. Um, we should be listening because we are handing these students their future planet. We are handing them their future society. They have a vital role in what, you know, what will happen um, it, as future generations move forward. They are a part of this um, and they have an absolute right and responsibility really um, to make sure that they are well prepared for that future. And that is really what this legislation is about. They saw in their own education, a lack of information that they needed. Um, and that was what this bill grew out of. And it's our responsibility as legislators to take that seriously. Um, it's easy to think, well, they're not voters. Um, they're not gonna vote for me. I have to worry about what my voters think. Um, but they will be voting for us, for folks who you know, are, are working, walking down that path. But more importantly, they're the ones most affected by the curriculum in our education systems. And they're the ones who know sort of what they are missing out on, what the pieces are that, that aren't enough, that they need more of to be well prepared for their own futures. This is a very broad subject, incorporating clean energy, pollution regulation, historic and institutional racism, climate change, and economic inequity um, from what I've been able to piece together. And frankly, it's hard for me to figure out the intersection of all of these issues. Is this really more aspirational than practical? Um, no, I don't think so. I think uh, the reality is that those sorts of things that you just listed, um, they impact our lives every day. They impact our communities every day. And just because it's hard, as I completely agree it is, this bill is will be challenging. Um, having those sorts of conversations around difficult issues is challenging, but that doesn't mean that we should shy away from it. And our students are telling us that they need those conversations, that they are ready for them, and that they know that they are important as they grow into adults. And so I think, will this, um, you know, adding this sort of curriculum, having these sorts of conversations, training teachers to have these conversations, will that be a challenge? Absolutely. Um, does it mean we shouldn't do it? Absolutely not. We owe it to our students to provide them with the information that they need to become, um, you know, the, the active, engaged community members that they want to be. I think some people might argue that this is more of a philosophical point of view, or a lens to understand the world, how all of these things intersect, and then how it would be taught in terms of reading, writing, and arithmetic, what kids really go to school for. Um, but there is some strong disagreement on some of these issues. So if some schools incorporate a curriculum like this, say voluntarily, other schools stick with what is a traditional you know, educational model, what does it mean for our society then if we have sort of two different types of education, two different learning experiences for our kids? Yeah, I think that's that's a really dangerous proposition um, because we already see how sort of polarized and siloed off we are, uh, how easy it is to stay in sort of your own community bubble and not experience uh, the lives of other communities and how they've interacted with them. That's why um, these students were really clear that this should be um, mandatorily built into the statewide curriculum. Um, this should be a part of it. And, and, you know, while it's, we can talk about some things that there are disagreement about, it is true that communities of color are dying and um, 
being affected by decisions we've made at a higher rate than white counterparts. It is true that we built I-94 directly through a black community that split it and made it more prone to the pollution from that area. It is true that there is an incinerator built in North Minneapolis in a predominantly black community and that they suffer from higher rates of asthma because of it. Those are true things that we can't pretend are controversial. Um, they're hard, they're hard conversations to have, but they're not controversial. And we have to you know, be, be honest with our students that, that this might lead to difficult political conversations, but the, the truth of it, the reality that our systems, some of our systems are set up to, to have harmful impacts on communities of color is a reality um, that if we want our students to be able to grow into adults who, who understand the realities of our communities, we have to be honest with them about those things. Uh, my final question is that any teacher will tell you there's limited hours in the classroom and there's so much that kids need to learn. And would this curriculum replace some traditional aspect? And you've already said that it won't really, it would be incorporated, but can you provide a couple different examples of, of how this could look? Sure. Yeah. You know, we when when I've talked to the students about this bill and started having conversations with educators about it, um, a lot of educators have said they're already having some of these conversations and that they would appreciate guidance on how to have more of them. Um, it does come up when we're when they're talking about. Um, you know, redlining and things like that in, in history class and what that looks like. And then if you combine the idea of redlining and sort of packing communities of color into certain geographical areas. And then you add in the conversation of, we built I-94 directly through that community where they were already packed and added a huge level of pollution to that community. That's, that's just one way that that comes in. You know, as we talk about climate change in science class and talk about, um, you know, endangered species and things like that. I still remember learning about the rainforests when I was in, you know, in junior high and, and needing to protect the rainforests and all of the things that we were losing because of them. Those conversations are still happening in different ways in science classes in elementary and junior high. And talking about the reality that, that those places, some of the places most hit, some of the places that will experience the first climate refugees in this world, our communities of color and what does that mean that we have intentionally sort of placed them there um, those are those are things they're conversations that are already having um, or we're on the brink of having and having guidance and requirement to have that whole conversation is really what the students are asking for they want the full well-rounded conversation um, and they don't want to have to be the ones responsible for making sure that they get that conversation. They want it to be a required part of their education. Senator Lindsay Port, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you so much, Shannon. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.